All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ed Remus, the Social Sciences Librarian at Northeastern Illinois University. On behalf of the NEIU Libraries, I'd like to welcome you all to this discussion, which is made possible by funding awarded by the American Rescue Plan Humanities Grants for Libraries. Today's event is also made possible thanks to the planning efforts of our moderator, Crystalyn Ortiz. Crystalyn is a master's student of history at NEIU, and she's also the founder and president of the NEIU History Club. Thank you, Crystal, and for bringing us together today. Thank you, Ed. Um, so as many of us know, in June of this year, in Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization, the US Supreme Court overturned two landmark decisions governing abortion rights, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. The court ruled that the right to an abortion is not constitutionally protected. As a result, individual states now have the power to decide whether abortions are banned severely restricted or completely legal in their jurisdictions. This decision greatly impacts individuals and healthcare providers around the US who can now be criminally charged for having an abortion or performing an abortion. In light of these events, we've gathered four scholars with distinct and sometimes differing perspectives on questions related to abortion law. We've asked our speakers to consider the following questions. What is history? I mean, what history, whether it be social, political, or legal, um, is most significant to understanding the current status of abortion rights in the United States. In light of this history, what future do you predict for the legality of abortion rights, for the politics of abortion rights, and for American society as a whole? Our first speaker, Professor Helen Alvarez, teaches law at George Mason University. Professor Alvarez will argue that the Dobbs opinion marks a return to a better constitutional substantive due process analysis and that the dissent's substantive due process proposal is neither workable nor a service to women. Our second speaker, Professor Akhil Reed Amar, teaches law and political science at Yale University. Professor Amar will argue that Dobbs is part of a conservative originalist revolution. In the years ahead, he will argue the court's liberals will need to learn how to do liberal originalism. Only if this happens will they have a fighting chance in the new era that's dawned. Our third speaker, Professor Alicia Gutierrez Romain, teaches history at La Sierra University. Professor Gutierrez Romain will argue that legal exceptions to abortion restrictions have, ha have been historically vague and uneven in their application, unnecessarily putting women at risk. Our fourth and final speaker, Professor Leslie Regan, teaches history, gender and women's studies, and law at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Professor Regan will argue that although the Supreme Court's majority opinion in Dobbs versus Jackson's women's health claims to be rooted in history, it is fake history. I've asked each of our panelists to give opening remarks for about 12 minutes each. After this, each panelist will take a few minutes to respond to any points raised by their fellow panelists. Then for the remainder of the event, Ed Remus will moderate questions from the audience. Professor Amar will need to leave our event at approximately 2.45. We want to end the event no later than 3.30, so I'll ask our panelists to give brief closing remarks by 3.15 at the latest. Now we'll hear from our first speaker, um, Professor Helen Alvarez. Professor Alvarez is the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and the Robert A. Levy Professor of Law and Liberty at the Antonin Scalias Law School at George Mason. There she teaches courses in family law, and in the religion clauses and publishes books and law review articles in both of these areas of law. Her newest book out last month is Religious Freedom After the Sexual Revolution. She's a member of Pope Francis's Council on Laity and Family and of his Commission on Clerical Sex Abuse. She's also an expert consultant for ABC News. Thank you for being with us here today, Professor Alvarez. Thank you so much. So I want to talk about how if you look at the prior abortion cases of Roe and Casey, and in some of the cases that relied upon them, you can see how unworkable is their test for determining what we mean by liberty in the 14th Amendment's uh, mention of liberty uh, guaranteed uh, by due process. I think that what the prior cases did was really an open invitation to substitute the opinions of a bare majority of Supreme Court justices for the ratified meaning of the 14th Amendment. 
I think this became really evident when the curtain was pulled back on what Rowan Casey said was reasoning, as it was in Justice Alito's Dobbs opinion, to reveal both the poverty and the unsuitability of these Casey's analyses reading <clears throat> of history. It revealed in Dobbs that more often than I think we're comfortable letting ourselves believe, we really are being ruled by the predilections of a rare majority of justices when it comes to what the meaning of freedom is. I think the dissenting opinions in Dobbs by Justices Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor only confirms the strong impression that I have. So ordinarily, of course, the court has required that there exists some kind of history and tradition in the US recognizing a claimed right before the court gets to conclude that the word liberty in the 14th Amendment <clears throat> uh, protects that right. Uh, Rowan Casey dodged this practice in favor of a barrage of misleading accounts of the nation's history, ancient theological, philosophical speculation, medical speculation, and a refusal throughout even really to confront the nature of the action they were granting a right to, the deliberate destruction of what every embryology book in the United States then and now refers to as human and alive. Not surprisingly, after this kind of analysis, those opinions reached a result opposed to the people and the states who ratified the Constitution. I think the Dobbs majority has a big, big uh, summary that's worth quoting here. Uh, about how Americans conclude what liberty is, <clears throat> which plainly acknowledges Americans' history and tradition regarding abortion. And here's what they said. When the Dobbs majority examines the history of the country on abortion, it finds, quote, an unbroken tradition of prohibiting abortion that persisted from the earliest days of the common law until 1973. And here I should mention, one can say that the common law prohibited abortion at a later period when there was medical evidence that human life was present. As soon as medical science confirmed the presence of the woman's part in all of it, right, the ova, the events of fertilization in her, medical science then shifts its position to say, we really ought to <clears throat> recognize human life as beginning at fertilization at the beginning. And then the common law shifts quite dramatically uh, so that it's in line with medicine as medicine is developing. The majority in Dobbs continued that the dissent could quote, not identify any pre-row authority that supports such a right. No state constitutional provision or statute, no federal or state judicial precedent, not even a scholarly treatise. Nor did the dissent dispute that abortion was illegal at common law, at least after quickening, that the 19th century saw a trend toward criminalization of pre-quickening abortions, that by 1868, a supermajority of states had enacted statutes criminalizing abortions at all stages of pregnancy. By the late 1950s, at least 46 states prohibited abortion, except if necessary to save the life of the mother. Even when Roe was decided in 1973, similar statutes were in effect in 30 states. Furthermore, for more than a century after 1868, when the 14th Amendment was ratified, including another half century after women gained the right to vote in 1920, it was firmly established that laws prohibiting abortion like the Texas law at issue in Roe <clears throat> were within states regulatory authority. And today, another half century later, more than half the states have asked us to overrule Roe and Casey, unquote. So I, I think that's kind of a great, better than I could do myself summary of the Dobbs majority's look at history. I think the majority's method for specifying the contents of the 14th Amendment's Liberty Clause, looking at what the people have said and done on the subject in the United States for centuries when they understood themselves <clears throat> to have a right to restrain abortion. I think this method is respectful of the people who enacted the 14th Amendment and the process by which it was done, state by state ratification. Furthermore, the Dobbs majority not only looked at the ratifiers interpretation at the moment of their affirmation, but also to their lived understanding of the law from the moment they ratified it through the decades following 1868 and even to the eve of Roe when nearly every state passed laws protecting life before birth in ways that Roe and Casey then forbade. I further think that an analysis of the dissent of Justices Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor only affirms the majority's understanding that it's dangerous to a constitutional democracy to ignore centuries of the people's history and tradition. It easily leads to a rule by a bare majority of the court. 
What did the dissent propose? It proposed that we look to a new formula, not to the people's constitutional history and tradition, not what they had done in their state laws, not what they understood themselves as free to do <clears throat> uh, for centuries, before, during, and after the 14th Amendment. We look to a new formula regarding how to determine constitutional liberty. They did this, they proposed this new formula on the grounds that the majority's method only ensures the continuation of a sexist male intention to deprive women of control over their own destiny and their individual bodies. They, they never actually confront the fact that there's a genetically different body within the woman. They constantly refer to it as just her body. Um, they <clears throat> believe that this intention, this sexist male intent was present in 1868 and undergirded states laws banning abortion by virtue of the fact that women themselves did not have the vote and were also impaired by a sexist society from themselves understanding their own freedom, including the freedom to terminate the lives of their sons and daughters in the womb. So what was the dissent's formula? Well, they proposed several iterations of it in order to determine the meaning of liberty in the 14th Amendment. First, to look to the long sweep of history and successive judicial precedents, each looking to the last and each seeking to imply the Constitution's most fundamental commitments to new conditions. Another time they wrote that the court should, quote, consider fundamental constitutional principles, the whole course of the nation's history and traditions, and the step-by-step -step evolution of the court's precedents. Finally, they framed their analysis as, quote, keeping true to the framers' principles by applying them in new ways, responsive to new societal understandings and conditions. But how did they apply their test? Who and what become proper sources to consult to determine things like, what's the sweep of history? What's, which, which judicial precedents? What is the nature of new societal understandings and conditions? So I'm going to look at what the dissenters said were acceptable sources to consult unacceptable, and the sources they simply ignore. They just didn't talk about them, even though they could very reasonably fit under the heading of their test, part of the sweep of history, part of our long history and tradition, part of uh, new societal conditions and understandings. Regarding their acceptable sources, I've been through the dissent line by line so often. Again and again, they refer back to the opinions of those Supreme Court justices in the contraception cases, Griswold and Eisenstadt, and then in the abortion cases, Roe and Casey, and in Lawrence, constitutionalizing consensual adult sex, and Obergefell, constitutionalizing same-sex marriage. <clears throat> but if you look at these opinions overall, you could say that they all have one thing in common. In order to specify the meaning of 14th Amendment liberty, they mostly ignore state laws and national traditions, in the case of Obergefell, they ignored dozens of laws to the contrary passed in the months and years immediately preceding the court's opinion uh, that the opposite of these laws was fundamental to the nation's, the nation's understanding of liberty. They did the same thing in connection with abortion. They also rely on a majority or a plurality of justices' opinions about things like, what is a better informed understanding of freedom? Or what kinds of rights do people need to determine the shape of their own universe? Unacceptable sources to consult, according to the dissent, are those laws restricting abortion before, during, and after the passage of the 14th Amendment <laughs> on the grounds that these are fatally sexist, they wrote. But of course, quote, people did not ratify the 14th Amendment. Men did. So it is perhaps not so surprising the ratifiers were not perfectly attuned to the importance of reproductive rights for women's liberty. Indeed, the ratifiers did not understand women as full members of the community. They also said that women themselves so oppressed could not possibly imagine the shape of their own liberty at that time, which if they had been able to, would have included abortion. So what are likely sources of authority the dissent ignored? Well, all the state's laws limiting abortion after women got the vote in the years between 1920 and the eve of Roe. Public opinion, which they acknowledged so many times throughout the opinion. They said abortion was a difficult and divisive issue. Americans had profoundly different views. It's a profoundly contested and contestable issue. They didn't even consult women's opinions on the subject. Poll after poll shows that women are about split like men on abortion, about, you know, most people oppose 
most abortions performed for reasons other than rape, incest, life of the mother, or um, and they oppose abortions after three months, or women are slightly more pro-life than men. They didn't even acknowledge the fact that Mississippi women voted more than Mississippi men for the legislators who passed the law in front of them. Further, they ignore the opinions of the leading female fig figures who were most conscious of their unacknowledged liberty and equality in the later 19th, early 20th centuries. The early suffragettes and feminists who nearly to a woman strongly opposed abortion as a sexist solution to a woman's issue. So after we ignore all state laws from the founding of the country to 73, all the early feminists, at least half the women in the country, all the laws passed while women had the vote between 1920 and Roe, and the women voters of Mississippi, who's left? Well, in the dissenters' view, the worthy or authoritative sources of interpretation of the 14th Amendment are only those Supreme Court justices who supported abortion rights in Roe and Casey, along with the dissenters themselves. Only these people can divine the meaning of the long sweep of history, the whole course of the nation's history and tradition. This adds up to 15 human beings, four women and 11 men, Kagan, Sotomayor, Breyer, O'Connor, Kennedy, Souter, Blackman, Stevens, Berger, Douglas, Stewart, Ginsburg, Powell, Marshall, and Brennan. I don't think this list guarantees either harmony with Americans' understanding of its own freedom, nor does it look like a particularly pro-woman agenda. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Alvarez. Now we'll hear from our second speaker, Professor Akhil Reed Amar. Akhil Reed Amar is Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches constitutional law in both Yale College and Yale Law School. After graduating from Yale College, um, <laughs> summa cum laude in 1980 and from Yale Law School in 1984 and for clerking, uh, clerking for judge and later Justice Stephen Breyer, Amar joined the Yale Law Yale faculty in 1985 at the age of 26. He's Yale's only living professor to have won the university's unofficial triple crown, the Sterling Chair for Scholarship, the Devane Medal for Teaching, and the Lamar Award for Alumni Service. Thank you um, for being with us here today, Professor Amar. Thank you so much for having me. It's um, such an honor to be with you all. Um, as you just heard um, from my colleague, um, Professor Alvarez, um, abortion is a very difficult issue. Um, thoughtful people have had different views of the matter uh, for centuries and continue. So thoughtful people today have different views. Um, putting my own personal cards on the table, you heard that I clerked for Stephen Breyer. That is true. Um, and you, you heard the, uh, about Justice Breyer's position on all this. My brother is also a law professor. Um, he's the dean, actually, of the University of Illinois College of Law. And one of our other colleagues, uh, Professor Regan, actually is, is, is from that university. I mentioned my brother, Vic, not just because I'm very proud of him, but because he clerked for Harry Blackman, um, the author of Roe versus Wade. Um, uh, I personally am pro-choice. Uh, so was my brother. Um, I respect a, 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 a Justice Breyer enormously. He's a friend and mentor. My brother had the same um, attitude toward uh, the person for whom he clerked, um, Justice uh, Blackman. All that said, um, I think that Roe was um, uh, a very unpersuasive opinion. Um, and um, so I'm pro-choice. That's how I'm going to vote. Um, uh, in this coming uh, election. That's how I voted in past elections, um, but anti-row, pro-choice, but anti-row. Um, and the reason that I am is that I have a certain constitutional method. Um, and it's the method that was very much on display, not just in the Dobbs case, but in the Bruin case that involved guns in New York. And uh, I, I think we can expect to see it going forward. It's um, an idea called originalism, and it focuses on what the Constitution um, was uh, understood to mean by the people who adopted it uh, originally, and um, um, when we're talking about an amendment, by the people who added the relevant amendment to the document. Now, um, uh, Dobbs's overruling of a half century of jurisprudence, of landmark cases like Roe and Casey, cases that 
most Americans actually probably know by name and that many Americans had come to um, believe were um, absolutely settled constitutional law, um, I'm sure came as a, a, a jolt, a shock, a, a deep surprise um, and uh, to, to many Americans and, and uh, to many an un unwelcome um, surprise at that. Um, but here's what originalism at the end means. It means the supreme law of the land is what the Constitution says, not what the cases say. Um, and, um, and we've been here before. Um, uh, so um, the originalist revolution, it was a conservative originalist revolution that we have seen um, in, in recent months, in, in June 2020, not just with Dobbs about abortion rights, reproductive rights, but with Bruin about gun rights. And, and there were other cases as well, a, a case called Carson about religious liberty and another case called Kennedy also about um, religious speech and religious liberty. Um, these cases dramatically modified precedents in Dobbs case overruled landmark precedents, Roe and Casey, and did so in the name of the Constitution, but we've been here before. This is an originalist conservative um, revolution, but in 1937, there was precedent um, that had accreted over a 50-year period of protecting um, liberty of contract and property rights, especially of um, the uh, economically powerful um, elements of society, employers, corporations. Um, uh, there was an, a 50 year period summarized by a strong judicial commitment to property rights and contract rights. Um, we law professors and lawyers call it the Lochner era from about the mid 1880s to the mid 1930s. And in 1937, that was all tossed overboard. And um, that was an, a, a, on the grounds that it was made up. Um, uh, that was a liberal originalist revolution. Now we're seeing a conservative originalist revolution. Um, in um, Brown versus Board of Education, the court tossed in 1954, tossed overboard really a, a half century of seemingly settled precedents um, uh, uh, epitomized by Plessy versus Ferguson uh, that upheld legal segregation, Jim Crow. Lots of people had grown up organizing their under, uh, life understandings around that. It seemed settled uh, to many. And Brown tossed that overboard in the name of originalism because liberal originalists said, it says equal. Separate isn't equal to the extent that Plessy says otherwise, Plessy must go. Just like to the extent that Lochner made things up, that was economic rights, um, it must go. Um, and what um, uh, uh, 1937 was to, uh, was to Lochner, excuse me, 2022 is to Roe. Um, what Brown was to Plessy, sort of, you know, turning uh, this overboard, actually a case called um, um, uh, Bruin, that was about, um, um, uh, Brown is about uh, racial equality in schools. Um, a case called Carson actually is about religious equality um, in, in schools. Um, in the 1960s, the Warren Court revolutionized area after area with very broad readings of the Fourth Amendment um, in cases called Map and Messiah, um, Fifth Amendment um, 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 uh, in, 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 in cases um, like Miranda. These are household names um, uh, today. Um, uh, uh, the rights of counsel in a case called Gideon. What the court, and, 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 and what blasted way beyond all the existing precedents in 1963. Those were liberal originalists saying, hey, it really says right of counsel. It really says Fourth Amendment rights. It, it really um, says um, 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 no coerced confession. Well, what the Warren courts did for the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment, the current court recently did for the Second Amendment in the Bruin case, again, in the name of originalism. So we've seen this before. Um, and that leads me to my first big point, that 
um, the liberals are making a mistake in not learning and uh, not playing the originalism game because originalism is not inherently conservative. It wasn't in 1937. It wasn't in 1954. It wasn't in 1963. And they need to learn about the text, history, and structure of the Constitution rather than just saying, oh, dead white men. Um, and you heard Professor Alvarez said, you know, that was to some extent what we heard in part from the dissent. I think that's a mistake going forward. Originalism. Um, is here to stay. It wasn't invented this year. It wasn't even invented in 1937. It was the understanding, the constitutional philosophy of Abraham Lincoln and John Marshall and Hugo Black, who was the great liberal um, engine of the Warren Court. So um, it's here to stay and liberals have to learn how to play that game. And if they do, they may have a fair chance of winning from time to time. Um, they didn't really talk nearly enough about women's equality, which is in the Constitution, about the 14th Amendment and the 19th Amendment. They didn't talk so much about um, uh, how a certain aspects of the 13th Amendment could be understood as protecting um, women's um, uh, bodies as well as their, their um, um, uh, um, equality rights. Um, my second um, point is um, I don't believe that um, I, although I do believe that uh, Dobbs portends a, a broader originalist revolution, I don't think that Griswold um, about uh, contraception is at risk, or Lawrence versus Texas about sodomy laws is at risk, and I'll tell you why. I don't think Obergefell about same-sex marriage is at risk, because you heard Professor Alvarez say the court basically says if they're unenumerated rights, um, they should be found by looking at state practice. Um, I would call that the privilege, of, the key language is not the liberty clause of the constitution because when you take it seriously, when you read its text, it says that uh, life, liberty or property actually can't be deprived without due process of law, fair procedures, but presumably with fair procedures, you can take away people's liberty or property for that matter, okay? But then the next sentence, see, because we're doing originalism, we have to read the constitution, it says no state, shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, the basic fundamental rights. Now, where do we find those basic fundamental rights? They're not all enumerated. And I think we find them in actual uh, practices of Americans uh, across the 50 states. This is very similar to what Professor Alvarez said and what Dobbs actually said and did. Um, now, when you count states, here's what she said. If you're counting states at the time of the 14th Amendment, most of the states had laws on the books prohibiting abortion, and no one said, hey, wait a minute, if we adopt the 14th Amendment, th that will invalidate all of those laws. If you look at eight, 1973, when Roe was decided by Harry Blackman from my brother clerk, Roe rendered unconstitutional the laws of 49 of the 50 states. They weren't Roe compliant with the, its trimester framework. Only New York was Roe compliant, and maybe not even New York. Um, so. Um, uh, and and she, she said, even today, lots of states are trying to prohibit abortions in ways that Roe and Casey um, didn't permit. So if you just look at actual state practices, it's going to be hard to get Roe and Casey. Um, but I think it's easy. And, 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 and here's a case that um, the Dobbs court relied on. It's a case because they had precedent um, also that they could point to. It's a case called Glucksburg. It was about um, a claimed right of assisted suicide. Here's what the court said in Glucksburg. We begin, as we do in all due process cases, by examining our nation's history, legal traditions, and practices. In almost every state, indeed in almost every Western democracy, it's a crime to assist a suicide. The state a suicide ban, assisted suicide bans are not innovations. They're longstanding expressions of a state's commitment to the protection and preservation of all human life. Okay, so they're saying, gee, assisted suicide isn't part of the American tradition, and abortion on demand isn't either quite. Um, but here's what is contraceptive rights. In Griswold versus Connecticut, case from my home state, only one state out of all 50 ever made it a crime for people, even married people, to use contraception in the privacy of their home. And here's what actually a legal traditionalist, John Marshall Harlan II, said um, in the uh, Griswold case. Conclusive, in my view, is the utter novelty of Connecticut's enactment. Although the federal government and many states have at one time or another had on their book statutes forbidding distribution of contraceptives, none so far as I can find has ever made use of contraceptives a crime. 
So Griswold's rock solid under the very test that the majority is using in Dobbs citing Glucksburg. Um, Lawrence versus Texas about sodomy rights. It's also actually rock solid. Here's what Justice Kennedy actually wrote in that opinion. Laws prohibiting sodomy do not seem to have been enforced against consenting adults acting in private for much of American history. It wasn't until the 1970s that any state singled out same-sex relations for criminal prosecution, and only nine states have done so. Over the course of the last decade, states with same-sex prohibitions have moved toward abolishing them. That, that's all a quote. He goes on to say that as of 2003, when the court was, decision was decided, only 13 states had laws on the books prohibiting consensual adult sodomy, four of which enforced their laws only against homosexual sodomy. And so he stressed that, quote, in those states where sodomy is still prescribed, whether for same-sex or heterosexual conduct, there is a pattern of non-enforcement with respect to adults acting in private. So, so I think um, Lawrence is solid. I think Griswold is solid. I think Obergefell is solid for a different reason because actually there's a strong equality argument based on the text of the constitution that if straights can marry, so can gays. Um, but liberals have to learn how to play this game. That's my second point, not just in this area, but across the board. Um, and if they do, they'll be able to save Obergefell and, and Griswold and Lawrence. My final point is I was just asked about um, uh, the political implications. I teach political science as well as um, uh, uh, a constitutional law. And um, I've, all, I've long predicted actually that the demise of Roe might actually help the Democratic Party, my party, um, more than the Republican Party. It may energize folks um, to, uh, to, um, to, uh, on the pro-choice side to vote because they can't count on the court just to, to make things up on its own. Um, so um, who knows what will happen in November, but I, I can just report to you anecdotally, um, I'm seeing lots and lots of people wearing t-shirts saying, row, row, row the vote. Um, and, I, uh, and, and we should expect more of that going forward. Um, so um, those are my three basic points. This is a conservative originalist revolution, um, uh, overturning precedents, but we've had earlier originalist revolutions, liberal ones overturning precedent, but once the liberals understand that, they need to learn on the court how to play that game. And if they do, they'll be able to preserve lots of other cases that they believe in and, and maybe actually move forward in, in other areas. And finally, um, that politically, Actually, um, um, there may be silver linings for those of us who are pro-choice. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Professor Amar. Um, now we'll hear from our third speaker, Professor Alicia Gutierrez Romine. Alicia Gutierrez Romine is an, an associate professor of US history at La Sierra University in Riverside, California, with an emphasis on California, the American West, the US-Mexico border, and the history of medicine. Dr. Gutierrez reminds current research explores the life and activism of Dr. Edna Griffin, the first black woman physician in Pasadena and her role in the civil rights movement in Southern California in the 1930s and 1940s. Her manuscript from Back Alley to the Border, Criminal Abortion in California, 1920 to 1969, which was published in 2020, traces the history of a medical procedure from the peripheral black back alley um, to the U.S. border, U.S.-Mexico border. This innovative work describes in detail what happened in California when medicine became subject to atypical legislation. Thank you for being with us here today, Professor Gutierrez. Thank you. So on May 2nd, 2022, an unprecedented leak of a U.S. Supreme Court opinion draft signaled that abortion rights were at risk. The 98 page document indicated that the court majority believed that Roe and Casey must be overruled and that abortion laws should be left to the people and their legislators to decide. When the official decision was handed down on June 24, 2022, outreach was plentiful, but few were truly shocked. Dobbs v. Jackson was a Mississippi case whose central issue was whether the state's gestational age act was constitutional. The act read, quote, except in a medical emergency or in the case of a severe fetal abnormality, a, a person shall not intentionally or knowingly perform, induce, or attempt to perform or induce an abortion of an unborn human being if the probable gestational age of the unborn human being has been determined to be greater than 15 weeks, unquote. 
As an abortion historian, I've explored in some of my research the concept of legal vagueness. And I believe, based on some of the other cases that I've studied, that there's plenty of that in this act. Calculating gestational age is not the same as measuring your height or weight. And even an OBGYN 101 course from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine states, quote, if everyone had normal regular periods every 28 days and could remember exactly when their last period was and ovulation was always occurring on day 14 of the menstrual cycle, then gestational age would be, determining gestational age would be easy, end quote. So if this was something that was truly measurable, there wouldn't be so many different ways to estimate it or to calculate it. And the existing practice suggests this is not something that can be determined without a margin of error. Would a physician who judged a pregnancy to be at 14 weeks gestational age who performed an abortion then be uh, penalized because another physician determined gestational age to be 16 weeks or 15 weeks? Um, just a short margin of days could determine whether an abortion was legal or illegal under this act. It also bears repeating that pregnancy is not a health neutral process. Um, some women experience pregnancy with very few complications, while others cannot perform routine tasks. Furthermore, maternal mortality in the United States was higher in 2020 than it was in 2019, and Black women have a maternal mortality rate of about 55.3 uh, deaths per 100,000 live births, which is a significant increase from 2019, when the maternal mortality rate for Black women was at 44 deaths per 100,000. So, According to uh, data from the American Journal for Managed Care, uh, the United States ranks lowest among other developed nations in maternal care and mortality. Given the risks that are associated with pregnancy and delivery in the United States, taking away federal protections to terminate a pregnancy is tone deaf, and it could also have disastrous consequences. For a court that is arguing that its ruling is consistent with protecting life, its cavalier attitude towards women's health and safety is decidedly telling. Aside from vagueness in calculating gestational age, there is also vagueness in determining exceptions, like what exactly constitutes a fetal abnormality. In the 1960s, during the thalidomide tragedy and the rubella outbreak, concerns over the possibility of fetal abnormalities did prompt some medical professionals and members of the public to demand access to abortion and more liberal abortion laws. While the thalidomide tragedy affected primarily Europe, Americans still saw and witnessed the unfolding of a pharmaceutical disaster that resulted in over 10,000 children being born with thalidomide-related disabilities, particularly phocomelia, which is a congenital malformation of the limbs. The thalidomide tragedy was followed by rubella outbreaks throughout the world, ultimately landing in California around 1964. And while rubella itself is a mild disease, it's often just a ration of fever, for pregnant women, exposure to the rubella virus can result in congenita rubella syndrome, or CRS in the fetus. When the rubella epidemic hit California with full force in 1965, physicians and hospital therapeutic abortion committees were uneven in their treatment of rubella-related abortion requests. In an examination of Bay Area hospitals, three performed abortions for patients exposed to rubella in the first trimester for fetal reasons, while some of the other hospitals only performed the therapeutic abortions following a rubella diagnosis if the mother appeared to have psychiatric reasons to justify it, like uh, risks of suicide. Other hospitals just considered each case individually. So ultimately, this meant that women were not always able to get legal abortions on the grounds of a fetal abnormality. It depended on her physician, the hospital, and how her case was presented to the therapeutic abortion committee. In the aftermath of the rubella epidemic, California governor, uh, Ronald Reagan, signed the Therapeutic Abortion Act to clarify abortion law and to align it with current medical practice. In an early draft of the Therapeutic Abortion Act, abortions were permiss permissible if, quote, there is substantial risk that continuance of the pregnancy would gravely impair the physical or mental health of the mother, there is substantial risk that the child would be born with grave physical or mental defect, or if the pregnancy resulted from rape or incest, end quote. Ironically, the provision related to grave physical or mental defect was removed from the final version of the act 
even though the rubella outbreak was in recent memory. In his analysis of the Therapeutic Abortion Act, Brian Pendleton, who was at the time a third year law student at Yale University, he was able to recognize one of the main problems that plagued hospital therapeutic abortions and their committees, and that was inequity. Legal therapeutic abortions were often easiest for white women of means to acquire. Even after the Therapeutic Abortion Act, poor women and women of color still relied heavily on illegal abortions. In a 1970 report to the California State Legislature, the Bureau of Maternal and Child Health found that non-white women underwent illegal abortions at a rate of 313 per 1,000 conceptions, while white women underwent illegal abortions at a rate of 103 per 1,000. 98% of the abortions performed on non-white women were illegal. When we look at the data for those who acquired therapeutic abortions from 1967 through 1969, between 85.8 and 91% of all therapeutic abortion recipients were white women. And most of these patients used insurance or private payment, and less than 15% of these abortions were performed in county hospitals, meaning most were performed at private hospitals. In the 1969 case, People v. Bellis, a physician was appealing his 1967 conviction. Dr. Bellis was convicted of abortion and conspiracy to commit abortion, but appealed because he believed that the woman's life was in danger, and he referred, to, uh, referred her to an abortionist uh, to save her life. Dr. Bellis feared that the young woman would turn to butchery in Tijuana. In their ruling, the California Supreme Court took issue with the clause necessary to preserve that was in the Pre-Therapeutic Abortion Act statute. The court stated, quote, the problem caused by the vagueness of the statute is accentuated because the doctor is delegated the duty to determine whether a pregnant woman has the right to an abortion and the physician acts at his peril if he determines that the woman is entitled to an abortion. He is subject to prosecution for a felony and to deprivation of his right to practice medicine if his decision is wrong. Rather than being impartial, the physician has a direct, personal, substantial, pecuniary interest in reaching a conclusion that the woman should not have an abortion. The inevitable effect of such delegation may be to deprive a woman of an abortion when she would be entitled to such an operation because the state has skewed the penalties in one direction. No criminal penalties are imposed where the doctor refused to perform a necessary operation, even if the woman should in fact die because the operation was not performed. A woman whose life is at stake may be as effectively condemned to death as if the law flatly prohibited all abortions." End quote. I believe this also holds true for the Mississippi Gestational Age Act. In crafting an abortion law that limits legal abortion to only certain criteria, physicians will be tasked with determining whether the patient fits those narrow categories. However, physicians will also be the ones at risk if penalties in their judgment are found, or are challenged, sorry. In the 1950s and 60s, California attempted to change its abortion laws, and instead they bureaucratized a medical decision best left to patients and their own medical providers. The Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs will have negative consequences for women of childbearing age throughout the country. The reality is that many of those who claim to be pro-life believe that abortion is a black and white issue, when in reality it is many shades of gray. Instead, we need to listen to the voices of those who have had abortions instead of pontificating to them. In bureaucratizing healthcare, we're delaying and making inaccessible treatments that many women will need. In compelling birth without increasing access to health care or welfare, we're showing we care more about an uncomplicated, abstract potential life than an actual child. In failing to couple abortion restrictions with increased contraceptive access or sex education, we're not providing the necessary resources to reduce the number of unwanted pregnancies. We can't have it both ways. We cannot force birth or life without some guarantee about quality of life. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gutierrez Romine. Um, now we'll hear from our fourth speaker, Professor Leslie Regan. Leslie Regan is a professor of history at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with affiliations in law, gender, and women's studies and media, media studies. 
She is the author of When Abortion Was a Crime, Women, Medicine, and Law in the United States, 1867 to 1973, the go-to book on the count of a century when abortion was the legal. It was awarded the James Willard Hurst Prize for the best book in socio-legal history. Dr. Regan has also published the award-winning Dangerous Pregnancies, Mothers, Disabilities, and Abortion in Modern America. Regan appears frequently on NPR and has written for the Washington Post, Slate, and Ms. Magazine. Thank you for being with us here today, Professor Regan. Thank you for having me. And I wanna thank all of you, Ed Remus, Francesca Morgan, Crystalyn Ortiz and everyone who's made this panel possible today, as well as the speakers in the audience. Um, I know there's a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, I actually have a power, some PowerPoints I wanted to share, so I'm going to go to share screen. Uh, it's disabled. I think I have to be allowed in. Okay, no, I'll give it a Thank you. Try Perfect. Now. Yeah. Um, There we go. Move the photos so that I can see my own screen. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So there's my, <laughs> our panel, Abortion Law in U.S. History and a very blunt <laughs> title since I was asked for one, uh, Fake History from the Supreme Court. Dobbs 2022. Um, I've put my books up here. I actually will give you the code later if you want uh, want it for a 30% discount from UC Press. Um, first, hmm, let's see if I can get it to move. Nope. Sorry. There we go. We don't have such great images for history. History matters to understand the present, our current context, our lives, to understand how we got here, to understand how change occurs, um, about how and why medicine, social norms, family life, gender, and the law have all changed over time. It matters to understand how the work, how the law works. And history really matters when fake history is produced in the nation at an extremely high level to reach a desired conclusion. I find it painful to know the history, the future, and the distortions of history in this case. The truth is that abortion is deeply rooted in our nation's history, in practice, in morality, and in law. Abortion was not always a crime, although Justice Samuel Alito speciously claims otherwise in the opinion, the majority opinion um, in the Dobbs case that overturned Roe versus Wade. Uh, that's the uh, sentence that an unbroken tradition of prohibiting abortion on pain of criminal punishment persisted from the earliest days of the common law until 1973. Um, the majority opinion by Justice Alito is more than mistaken. It's more than bad history. It is intentionally incorrect and misleading. It is fake. And for that reason, we have to discuss it. Um, further and break it down. Uh, that sentence. <laughs> so, first of all, oh, I'm getting all these things. Um, abortion, as practiced, uh, has a long history in the U.S. Um, early, what we call abortion, early abortions. Uh, in the what we might think of as the first trimester, but early abortions uh, were not even called abortions. They were called restoring the menses, getting your period back on track, trying to get rid of an obstruction. Uh, 
women themselves shared information with their sisters, their daughters, their friends um, on how to return their menses uh, using plants that they uh, plants and, and materials that they knew of. Uh, here we are seeing um, black cohosh, the uh, plant that indigenous people were familiar with on the top to the left black hellebore which was the plant used in very commonly in Europe had to be imported by uh, European settlers to the Americas. Um, cotton root, I'm sure that's snake, this is uh, snake root and cotton root, which you see packaged, uh, was very familiar with enslaved Africans and juniper, um, which was common and grew wild throughout the United States. So that was actually the most accessible um, for Americans from the earliest periods of European settlement through the 19th century. And as you can see here, this was also commercialized. Um, and and uh, people could buy cotton root bark or female pills um, to deal with the stoppage of nature or obstruction, as it says on that package. People could also turn to guidebooks written by doctors full of information about how to take care of your own health or your family's health that included information on how to return the menses, how to deal with an obstruction, which ranged from um, hot baths, uh, bleeding, um, and, and using these kinds of concoctions. These were extremely popular, published many times into the mid 19th century with titles like uh, Buchan's Domestic Medicine, The Married Lady's Companion, or The Female Medical Repository. They might have this in their own home. Um, so Alito avoids this well-established history of the practice of abortion and the legal under the legal and moral and, and medical understanding of these what we call abortions, which were not even called abortions. Common law in England, and of course, as recognized here in the US, uh, referred to quickening. At the point of quickening, if somebody interfered with an abortion, that was illegal. That was a crime, and that was recognized as immoral by women themselves and in the general public, because at that point, she herself felt movement within her. She felt life within, stirring within her. And at that point, and only at that point, was it illegal? There are plenty of cases available that makes this quite clear into the mid and late 19th century that uh, this opinion avoids recognizing. It's easy to find. It's available with citation after citation after citation in a brief that was produced by historians uh, that represents the knowledge and understanding of over 10,000 historians, teachers, and scholars uh, in the American Historical Association and the Organization for American Historians. The history of quickening and its meaning is, in con is conveniently dismissed in a footnote by Justice Alito. Let's see. We've been talking about what the laws are by the 1860s and 1870s. It is extremely relevant to know how these laws came about. They did indeed come about because primarily one person, Dr. Horatio Storer, who is here on, his, on the screen, and this is an example of one of his publications, Criminal Abortion in America, uh, began to talk about, um, began to init, initiate a fight against abortion and to criminalize it beginning at conception, before quickening, to change the laws. As Storer talked about this, he scoffed at women's own bodily knowledge of when they were pregnant, when they understood to be pregnant, and insisted instead that they did not know, doctors themselves knew what the true science was. Science hadn't changed at all. What had changed was that 
a, the elite physicians who newly formed the American Medical Association were did not have the power and authority that they wished for. There were no licensing laws. They were in competition with people whom they considered to be inappropriate practitioners, midwives, homeopaths, Indian healers, all kinds of people, and women themselves. Uh, and what had become visible, the practice of abortion in early stages had become visible, had become commercialized. You could buy these products, you could find advertisements in your newspaper. Um, there were practitioners who specialized in providing uh, ways to deal with an obstruction, to bring the menses back, what we now call abortion. And particularly Madame Restell in New York had become infamous, had become the object of scandal sheets and newspapers. And she was primarily providing abortions for married middle-class white women. And his, his work uh, emphasized as did many others, um, that the uh, that this is who's having abortions, that immigrant families had larger families, Catholic families in particular, and that the really the nation as they knew it, Americans as whom he believed were Americans, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, uh, would were on decline. And instead, the women of that class we're seeking political power, we're trying to get into medical schools and um, avoiding their true duty uh, to have children. And there, I, I don't have a quote in front of me, but from the loins of these women, if it doesn't come from the loins of our women, who will be populating the nation? It's pretty much the direct quote. Now, Storer comes up and again, Alito dismisses this very quickly saying he's just one man. The states themselves passed these laws. We don't know that he was the person. We don't know that they agreed with any of his ideas in the state legislatures. But we do know. We know that every state medical society that brought their proposed model laws to the states were bringing a proposal written by Dr. Storer. They were bringing his theories, his data, his evidence. He wrote the memorials and the letters. He is the ghostwriter behind it. And this is a very appealing, these, these are not unusual views for that time period. Uh, to pretend, I mean, anyway, it's to pretend otherwise. I don't know where we are at this point. Okay, so, uh, I have to see time. Oh, I didn't start my time, so I don't even know how far we are. Let me know, please. <laughs> um, Many Americans clearly still believed in quickening and still obtained abortions following the passage of these laws. And I just have images here to show you that it is every class, every racial group, every ethnicity, every religion. And we have the evidence that shows this. We also know that doctors were performing abortions and were very involved in the practice of abortion. Uh, even those who said otherwise sometimes. And I, I want to add, uh, well, let me briefly talk about the enforcement of the laws, because once these laws went into place, were written into place, uh, the laws had to be enforced. One of the things that they found very quickly was they Prosecutors could not win unless they had a deceased woman's body. Juries would not convict. And so this is why I have here an image of the Chicago Cook County coroner from the early 20th century. Um, they become central to, you know, finding cases when a woman dies and then pursuing the case against the provider. So you could see this as medical mal malpractice. And I think that is how it's viewed. Uh, they're trying to get put out of business the people who are um, bad, who are poor practitioners. Now, to do that, they have to rope in the doctors into interrogating women. 
and asking them on their deathbeds at home and in the hospitals, who did this to you? When was it done? Who's the father? And many other uh, invasive, humiliating private questions in order to collect evidence for the coroner. The woman's body itself was the evidence as well as her words. And we cannot, we cannot imagine away the effects of investigation and law enforcement as though this was not the case. This is just an image of the kind of the places, the words where this was occurring throughout the entire 20th century up until 1973, and which is already happening again, even before the Dobbs decision. For women who miscarry, um, that is, was the practice then, it's already becoming the practice now. Police surveillance uh, as, as childbirth and abortion had become safer uh, with the development of antibiotics, there are not as many cases uh, where women have died, often because of their own practices, you know, we can go into that, but um, they turn to actually trying to capture the provider in raids, to capture the provider and the patient lying on the table, as in this image, all nurses and assistants, any people waiting for an appointment, any person afterwards, arrest them, take them to the police station, uh, fingerprint, and sometimes do forced gynecological examinations to collect evidence from her body, and then force people to speak about their abortions in public courtrooms in front of men, mostly journalists, attorneys, judges, police. The idea that this, that overturning these laws or allowing these kinds of laws again will have no effect on women themselves who have abortions is again, uh, I mean, I've used professional terms like utter baloney, as I think people understand quite well. Um, now, the other part of this is, uh, which um, Alicia just uh, kind of alluded to is, in fact, there were always legal abortions. Always. We could go to history. If we want to use history, supposedly, as our main method, we can also find abortion was always legal. It was written into those laws in the 1860s and 1870s that there were legal abortions. And the decision about what was legal was left to doctors to decide with their, um, with their patients. So I think, what do I have next? We can talk at great length about how the Supreme Court should be making decisions, what it should be based on. I think we also have to admit that this idea that somehow the Supreme Court is in a vacuum that does not respond to, is not influenced by its own social economic, cultural, and political context is, is fatuous and is ahistorical in itself. The way that Roe is treated uh, by this opinion and the anti-abortion movement is, is to, to ignore all kinds of things. It is simply not the case that Roe versus Wade came out of the blue, out of nowhere. It came from states that were already legalizing abortion, expanding abortion with the form, reform laws, referendums, um, and, and, and movements made of doctors and lawyers, as well as the women's movement that we think of on the streets, pushing in all means that they could find to overturn these laws. It had already been overturned by a number of federal courts throughout the country. Focusing solely on state laws, as though that is an expression of the state's residents thinking 
in 1960s or 1973 is also as and even in the present. The people who are in the legislatures, uh, you know, we have an impact. We hope we have an impact with our vote, but it is designed in a particular way and particular people are more likely to be elected and running it. And we cannot pretend otherwise in the time that we live in, where we are so familiar with money in elections, with gerrymandering, and really the original design of our entire republic to really give greater recognition and power to rural areas and more conservative forces. And I'm probably over time, so I'll just leave it there for the moment. But I look forward to um, comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Regan. Um, I'd like to thank each of our four panelists for sharing their opening remarks with us. Now we'll begin a round, a response round, during which each of our panelists will have an opportunity to respond to any points of interest raised by their fellow panelists. We'll encourage our speakers to use this time as an opportunity to clarify sites of divergent and convergent interpretations. I'd also encourage our panelists to use their time to pose questions to each other. I'll give each of our speakers three to five minutes for this purpose in the order in which they delivered their opening remarks, beginning with Professor Alvare. Thank you very much. So some of the things that come to mind are the history of abortion in the United States, according to Joseph De La Pena's book and Marvin Olasky, Abortion Rights. There have always been things done in society which people regarded as <clears throat> problematic or inhumane, but have nevertheless been had some hold on some communities and had been had had some tradition. Today, we might say there's communities of that believe in female genital mutilation, etc. But we never say that because the practice exists <clears throat> by itself that consists in a tradition. These things were held in. Um, as, as, as truly morally problematic. And if you actually look at the discussions in the literature of the 19th and 20th century and in the judicial opinions, uh, I think it's not true history to say uh, that this was about making sure that Protestants had their share of babies, et cetera. Um, sure, you had some people who spoke about that but the language in the states, the language of the people's literature, the language of judicial precedents, um, I think <clears throat> definitely makes that problematic. The other thing is there's a discussion here of, of women at all times without really any um, balancing even of a proper respect for innocent human life. And I, that was something that struck me about the dissent's opinion. <clears throat> and I just think it struck me about the conversation here as well. Um, you know, when, when there is human life on the other end of the instruments, there is an argument to stand down and say, at the very least, respect means not harming. Um, another point that I would raise on the medical history, I think it's been really well documented by this point that the United States doesn't even have a serious interest in whether women are harmed by abortion. It doesn't require that information to be collected. Um, because of the way medical data is collected, that women will show up with a perforated uterus or some other problem, but it'll never be recorded that it's an abortion. Um, we really don't know how many women are harmed by it. Um, and there really isn't a good argument um, <laughs> that we have good data on that. Um, we also know that, um, you know, what the Dobbs opinion did was to allow states to regulate the argument about what women want or what's good for women, I just, it keeps ignoring the fact that women are hotly divided on this in the past and in the present. Women run the leading pro-life groups. Women run thousands of centers to help single mothers. Um, they would just love it if pro-choice groups would step up and assist this, even as they discuss the need for this sort of thing, particularly in a post-Dobbs environment. There is no Planned Parenthood version of these thousands of, and it's not, we're not talking about free diapers. We're not just talking about something small. I have spoken at hundreds of these centers. We're talking about lifetime friendships and support. Um, so it's, it's problematic to make an argument that women are medically better off with legal abortion 
um, when um, it was mentioned by um, Dr. Gutierrez Ramin about listening to the women who've had them, again, if only Planned Parenthood and other abortion clinics would do that, um, in the tradition that I come from, the Catholic tradition that has Project Rachel, we see thousands of women a month who have had abortions, and we talk to them. For a year, I spent one night a week talking to women for hours and hours who'd had them. It is not the straightforward question that I think has been posed here about what benefits women. There's still so much we don't even know about abortion's harm. If the federal government wanted to know, it would take up this question. I was on the NIH panel that continually refused to do so. If we cared about how injured they were or the effects of abortion on them, uh, if we cared to help them bring children to term, I think we would do more of that. So it's just, there's a lot of misstatements and a lot of statements about things that are supposedly true, but there's a lot of contrary evidence. We couldn't possibly get it in in this tiny bit of time, but I encourage people to explore some of the resources that I've talked about, the De La Pena book, the Alaski book, the CDC's statements on the collection of abortion statistics, and uh, finally, the institute named after one of the earliest doctors in the United States, a very strongly pro-life feminist, Charlotte Lozier and her institute. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, um, Professor Alvare. Now we'll hear from Professor Amar. Um, <clears throat> Law, I, I'm in a, a tradition um, uh, of the law school, and law is a very blunt instrument. Um, and that's one of the reasons I personally am pro-choice, because there's so many heartbreaking medical and moral situations that the law will actually handle very poorly, because um, it's the law, and it's, it's, it's a blunt blunderbuss. And so I hear very much um, and agree with um, some of the um, uh, the concerns that uh, Professor Gutierrez uh, uh, Romin um, uh, identified. She also identified uh, real problems, issues. Uh, there, there are desperately wanted pregnancies that are not going to have successful outcomes. That um, and 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 women who want to preserve their uh, reproductive capacities in, in the future and, and need to terminate the existing one. I also hear um, uh, very much her. Um, points about um, what uh, caregivers in the medical community who are morally serious and ethically serious are supposed to do. I, I'm the black sheep of the family. My mom uh, was a doctor. My dad is a doctor. My wife is a doctor. My brother is a doctor. Most of my cousins and aunts and uncles are doctors. So, so I think there are concerns about this. But now here's the there's constitutional law is also blunt. And, and, and so that's why personally I'm pro-choice. Constitutional law is very blunt. Um, the uh, racially disparate impacts actually don't aren't a constitutional argument under a constitutional doctrine um, of Washington versus Davis or the class impacts. Um, whether Justice Alito got all his history right actually doesn't matter truthfully. And the historian's brief actually, because it's done by historians and not law professors, is focusing on stuff that's less to the point, which is what are you know the laws on the books in the 1860s. Um, and if there were these laws on the books and yet no one talked about them when the 14th Amendment was adopted, there's an issue about elephants hiding in mouse holes and gee. Um, at the time of Roe versus Wade, the laws on the books in 49 states are really um, not in line with the trimester framework announced by Roe. Um, so um, now final point that I'm gonna make is laws aren't on the books aren't always enforced. That's true. So how do we think about non-enforcement? But, but the, the, the Constitutional law is going to be blunt too. It's actually going to look formally at whether there's a formal racial classification or just a mere disparate impact, because almost all laws have a racially disparate impact. Almost all laws have a, a class impact, and that's not going to be, almost all laws are going to be vague in all sorts of ways, and it's going to be very hard, candidly, as I'm telling you this as a con law expert, to actually get um, uh, at least a, a Supreme Court, and not just this Supreme Court, but any Supreme Court, um, to um, go for the vagueness thing. There were some lower courts in the 1970s, but I'm not really seeing um, that today. Uh, the law itself has a margin of error built into it. You know, um, oh, I thought I was driving 50. Um, four, but you're clocking me at 57. Um, you know, you say to the um, uh, the the, the um, uh, officer who who fly, uh, pulls you over. Um, so the law sometimes itself has a kind of margin of error built into it. There are mens rea doctrines about intent um, and, and the rest. But 
on the point, the final point about laws that are on the books that aren't always enforced, um, the key is whether they're routinely enough enforced. And if they are, the court's actually going to count them, has typically counted them. That's why what I said about Lawrence was very interesting. Those laws about sodomy were almost never enforced. That's really different than you know, laws that are sometimes enforced and not and selectively and only for certain classes or races and not others. And there was a reason, by the way, and here I end, why sodomy laws were almost never enforced against private conduct because there's actually a legal rule. The legal rule is accomplices can't testify against each other. Now, if you have two adults in private and they, uh, they're, they're the only ones who know what's happened because it's in private, and their accomplices, neither can testify against each other, so you will never have a prosecution, okay? Unless it's a rape situation where one person says it wasn't consensual, I'm a victim, and that person testifies against the other, or you're talking about something that happens in public where there are, are um, um, uh, 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 people who are offended who didn't want to see um, what was what was done in public. So um, I, I'm sorry I have to uh, dash off now, but just to repeat, one of the reasons I am pro- choice personally is the law is very, very blunt. It doesn't deal with all sorts of complexities. And that's unless true of constitutional law as well. It's going to actually look at only certain things and count only certain things, formal race discrimination, um, or um, just the, the, the laws on the books, unless those laws are never enforced. Um, so thank you very much to my colleagues. I've actually learned a lot today, and I'm very appreciative to you all. Thank you, Professor Amar, for being with us. Thank you. Um, now we'll hear from Professor Gutierrez Romain. Um, so I guess just a, a couple things. Um, I think when we're talking about, um, you know, dangers or, um, you know, long-term consequences or effects for women, I think it's important to recognize and remember that a lot of the discussion about the dangers of abortion are specifically referring to things like illegal abortion, but also surgical abortion. And we're in a moment right now when approximately 90% of abortions are performed by medication and that medicated abortion is safer for women than a colonoscopy is for a lot of people. So, you know, when we're talking about dangers and risks and stuff, we're talking about a pre-medicated age. And so that argument doesn't quite work so well in the current age. But also if we're talking about dangers in terms of psychology, there was a recent study in 2020 uh, that was published in Social Science and Medicine. They found that after five years of having abortion, about 84% of women expressed that they still felt like they made the right decision and they were happy with the decision that they made or they had no feelings uh, that were negative at all. So I think there is, it's, it's a bit patronizing to say that, you know, women don't know what they're doing or that they haven't really considered, you know, the options because that same study also found that people did debate a lot and, and take a lot of in, uh, consideration into this, the decision that they made to terminate a pregnancy. Um, and if we're looking just at perspectives of people, there was a recent study by Pew that found between two thirds and four fifths of Americans support abortion in at least some instances. Um, and that seems to be pretty standard. Um, and then one, well, two more things. Um, one of them is kind of building on the, the last thing that Professor Regan said is that, you know, we are operating on the assumption that, you know, the law is neutral and that the people who are making these laws are unpersuaded or unaffected by things that are going on. I am much more cynical uh, than that. And while I believe that's how things are supposed to run, when we have a institution that is populated by people, there's no way to kind of buffer against that. And finally, um, there is no consensus on when life begins. People from different faith traditions believe different things, and some faith traditions uh, believe that there should always be an exception. So we cannot say definitively that this is life because that is contingent upon the person themselves and how they perceive that, that fetus that is in them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gutierrez <laughs> Romain. Um, now we're gonna hear from Professor Regan. Hi, thank you. This has all been quite interesting. Um, so I, I guess the first thing is to just say that uh, Professor Amar's uh, points on originalism, he, he could very well be right that this would be a better direction for uh, 
attorneys, constitutional scholars to develop their arguments along these lines. I think we also have to say that originalism is one particular way of interpreting law and making decisions about the Constitution, what is constitutional and what is not. Uh, it, it is uh, indeed a conservative um, method and um, we do not, I do not believe that America and Americans should be, uh, laws should be based solely on what we think or know was the history uh, in the 18th century or in 1867. We are not the same country. We're not in the same place, fortunately. Uh, so there's a whole nother legal debate about that method and whether that's appropriate Etc. which I won't go into. I don't, you know, that's uh, for others people to look at. But there are other ways such as looking at equality and looking at rights and that so, human rights, civil rights that we have in the Constitution, um, they're not subject to the vote. They're not subject to a majority or a opinion in the country. Otherwise, we would have lots of rights that we would enjoy. We would not or many of us would not, depending on who we are and the circumstances. Um, we've been hearing quite a bit of disinformation. Uh, the history books that uh, Professor Ava Alvare refers us to, there are two or three. There are more than half a century worth of research uh, that is deeper and broader. And those two or three come from a specific perspective and are really not regarded as uh, the top scholarship by historians. Um, and we're hearing, uh, you know, uh, really what we're hearing is about a religious perspective. Um, Alicia has just referred to that the idea of when life begins is not universally held. We have a debate about it. And if we, and um, the, the, the push um, to insist that it is known when human life it is, is and determined by um, the position of the current anti-abortion movement and the majority opinion in this case, uh, is to ignore um, the multiplicity of understandings of religious values in this country. Um, and the long history that we can find where Abortion was morally acceptable. This was a common understanding. And we'd have to go into why don't we see people saying it in the 1860s? Um, you know, everybody doesn't have an equal voice now or then. They don't have equal access to publications, uh, et cetera. Um, we're hearing about disinformation about medicine. Um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has uh, plenty of research. The Institute, the Academy of Sciences has done research. They've put out statements regarding the health and dangers of abortion versus forced birth versus childbirth. Um, go to the official medical experts. The pregnancy centers, the crisis pregnancy centers have been pushing disinformation for decades telling people that abortion will cause breast cancer, will cause cancers, it will cause psychiatric distress. It doesn't cause breast cancer. The psychiatric distress, yes, some people feel, I mean, they do have distress. This to suggest that abortion should be legal does not deny people's feelings. It does not deny that there are um, disagreements among women. There doesn't have to be agreement among women about whether they consider this morally acceptable or about their own feelings about having an abortion or, or not. Uh, the law, I mean, as, as our departed guest has said, the law is a blunt instrument and um, it is in the process, of course, uh, uh, forcing people to uh, live up to, to 
be forced to live according to some religions. And that's the long, that is the history of the anti-abortion movement um, in the US. It is, it, is, uh, uh, it is led by religious, a religious movement. And uh, yes, we need to talk about religion. It's the Catholic Church in the 60s and early 70s were the only people who were speaking against the reform and legalization of abortion. And that's fine. They should then and now. But it is a pretense to think that that's the only religious voice out there. It never was. There were also hundreds of churches who, who advocated and who require that an abortion be done, the woman's life is first. And the history is, of course, Catholic doctors uh, oppose that. There should never be a therapeutic abortion to save a woman's life. Now, in saying this, I am not saying it is solely the Catholic Church. Uh, Catholics, evangelical Christians, Mormons were connected around this. People who disliked each other uh, via the new right, who found it to be quite useful in terms of partisan politics. And this has to be part of our understanding of how this decision has come about. I don't know if I have more time or less, but I think I'm done for the moment. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, now we'll begin a round of questions and answers with the audience. Ad Remus will be moderating our Q&A round. Um, so after Ad poses each question, any and all of our speakers should consider themselves invited to jump in and share their thoughts in any order. Ed, uh, will you please share a question with us? Yes. Thank you, Crystal. And at this point, I would invite our audience to use the Q&A feature to post some questions. I will pose questions on your behalf. Um, and if we have uh, multiple questions on the same topic, I may agglomerate them. I'd like to begin with a question of my own. Um, and I'd like to invite each of you to try to theorize uh, the opposition, so to speak. Um, Professor Alvarez, when you think about uh, both the mass support for legal abortion, as well as the political movement in support of that aim, how do you theorize the historical societal conditions that have motivated that? And then yeah. also for professors Gutierrez, Romine, and, and Reagan, Regan, um, how when you think about, and, and Professor Regan, you were addressing this a little bit before, but maybe can expand on it a little bit. When you think about the past decades of uh, mass societal, uh, to some extent, a, a, a mass constituency uh, in, in broad opposition to greater legal abortion, and when you think about the political movement that has formed in support of that goal, how do you sort of theorize the societal historical conditions uh, for that? So, um, Professor Alvare. That's a great question, first of all, thank you. Um, a couple of things. I think first is the oppression of women, particularly in their ability to become pregnant, and the disvaluing of our mothering and the disvaluing of work that is not paid, um, uh, feminism, and I consider myself a feminist for, well, as long as I first heard the word in the, in the 60s. Um, feminists who I think too much embraced what Professor Joan Williams would call the ideal male worker version of what is progress for women. Uh, imbibed a social notion that interdependency, care for the vulnerable, time spent in something that is not remunerative or publicly valued is not valuable. Um, and I think that message to women has been forever and ever, and it's been even more so since we're in a economy with, you know, kind of unbridled capitalism that values money and accomplishment and not the hidden work of caring for the needy. And then second, finally, and related to that, I think it's just a diminished respect for human life. Um, you know, are not taking sufficiently dramatic steps to meet climate change. The, the fact that we continue to have capital punishment, um, the fact that we are not really taking care of the poor, that we haven't really got a peace movement anymore. Um, 
that we say we love children, but we really put them at the back door. We put adult interests first. And when the children suffer, we say, well, we'll try and figure out something for them that will be therapeutic or ameliorative after the fact. So, and I do think sort of, you know, Americans not really respecting science as much as we say we do. Um, there isn't a textbook in the country that doesn't call life before birth human and alive. No embryology textbook at any med school at any university. But we don't like to think about that um, because that is vulnerable and unseen life. So I think, again, it's, um, it's the way women have been treated, pregnancy, mothering has been treated, and Americans' um, insufficient willingness to make sacrifices for very vulnerable lives. And somehow this got blended into the best parts of feminism and, and, and poisoned this particular strand of it. That would be my, my thought on it. Professor Gutierrez Romain. Could you repeat the question? Because I wasn't sure I, I got the last half of it. Yes, um, I would like to ask each of you, how would you theorize the both the sort of broad mass support to some degree, as well as the more particular political movement in support of, um, in, in your case, greater legal restriction on abortion, when you think of it um, societally as a historical um, societal political phenomena. How do you theorize uh, the opposition, so to speak? What what do you think might be motivating people or conditioning them to oppose um, uh, oppose legal abortion? Okay. Um. So, you know, from the perspective that I've seen, um, I see to some extent the influence of religion on on this, um, and. So I would imagine that religion plays a big role in those who are opposed to, to abortion. Uh, historically, we see moments where um, there is kind of merging, uh, emerging women's rights movements, and then that seems to align with cracking down on, on women's um, bodily autonomy. Um, and so perhaps some of the arguments could be framed in this kind of idea that there is a return to some type of traditional value. Um, but what does that then mean for the people who are involved? And is it about restoring some type of, of society wherein women have fewer options and resources um, and that women are more dependent? Um, and then as for religion, you know, the I think the problem with that is that if we put that at the forefront of abortion restriction, it completely, again, you know, with the last comment that I made, neglects the variety of, of religious faiths that are in practice and even the people who have no faith at all. Um, that is, I think, you know, a, a, something to consider as well. I think many of the people who advance a religious argument frame it in terms of a moral argument, but those morals are not universal as well. And, you know, I think there's also a tendency on the people who favor abortion restrictions to believe that there are women who are mothers and there are women who have abortions and that there is no overlap between the two when that is not the case. And so this goes back to what I said about thinking that abortion is a very black and white issue when it's not. Um, in one of the examples that I researched, it was a woman during the Great Depression who died from an illegal abortion. And the coroner in his annotation mentioned that she was already a mother of four children. She was already on county relief. And you know she likely made the decision to have an illegal abortion because she feared for the livelihood of her existing four children while she was on welfare. And we cannot, you know, as I mentioned, have these abortion restrictions without, um, you know, something else to back it up. If we are trying to reduce the number of unintended pregnancies, then what are the other options? You cannot just compel birth and then leave that child. So those would be, I think, some of the the ways that I envision people who favor restriction is that it's, you know, religiously guided, um, that it's maybe anti-feminist and that it tries to simplify the abortion issue when it's much more complicated than it is. 
Thank you. And Professor Regan. It's a complicated question. <laughs> um, so I, I certainly uh, agree with everything that was just said um, in terms of explaining the uh, rise in strength of the anti-abortion movement. Um, I think we also have to, the strength has to also be understood in terms of uh, first, it's easier to try to get rid of a law than it is to get a Supreme Court decision to do what people hoped for. What what people wanted to achieve with Roe versus with you know the decriminalization of abortion was much larger than what Roe says, right? And and so there's a whole feminist critique of Roe that at the same time people support Roe because. Uh, of their concern about criminalization. Um, but we also have to see uh, that the media has played a role in always kind of producing two sides as though they're equal in the language that's used in the fear of, of the anti-abortion movement, um, the uh, money that is put into it. And um, again, the the way that it has worked politically in our political system. The new right found that this was a very useful way to shift voters from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. White uh, middle working class people in the South who had voted Democratic, white working class people in the North who had voted Democratic, they could see that talking more openly about family values, anti-abortion, anti-homosexuality could attract those voters and submerging some of the uh, uh, anti-racial integration, the anti-busing, the clearly racist thinking, subordinating that a bit more could bring those people towards the Republican party. There's research that shows close links as much as we dislike it between the uh, racism that was quite open from Nixon and others and the, the rise and strengthening of um, the anti-abortion movement with the Republican Party. It's worked well. Um, that doesn't say anything about people's own feelings, which come from all kinds of places, right? There's what they're taught. People are taught you know, to be against birth control, or they're taught, and they may not feel that way at all. They may not behave as taught, as expected, as told what's moral. Their feelings might not match that. And, and um, you know, that's this other kind of hidden part of it. Uh, the majority actually has always used, found ways to try to prevent pregnancy, and ways to end it because the goal is to prevent having children having more children and um the pretense that somehow this began with the rise of the latest feminist movement in the 60s and 70s of course this is absurd that did not just begin with the sexual revolution um in terms of valuing motherhood uh, i think again that is a red herring, uh, as Alicia has just pointed out. Mothers have abortions. People who aren't mothers who have abortions often have children later. Women having abortions are almost, are really probably always, thinking about possible children and making decisions for their own life and out of love for possible children in the future. And um, yeah, I mean, I could give examples of that, but I think I've given plenty. Thank you all. Um, I, I would like to pose a question now that I received anonymously from a student uh, and ask all three of you to address it. Um, do any of the scholars believe that in order to protect abortion as a right, it needs to be codified? What will it take to get there considering this backward step? So I'm wondering, um, you know, in light of that question, maybe beginning with Professor Alvarez, 
Um, obviously, that's an outcome that you would oppose, but um, presumably you've thought through what might happen in the future to, to produce that outcome. So how do you theorize that and or, or think about that um, possibly happening in the future um, politically, socially? What would that look like? Um, and I guess since Professor Amar had to step out of our discussion, um, I'll just ask, do you see it playing out on originalist grounds um, as, as he would like it to? Um, and, and then also for professors Gutierrez, Romine, and Regan, um, what do you think it will take to restore something like a codification of abortion rights in the United States? Um, and also, do you see it proceeding potentially on, on an originalist uh, logic, as Professor Amar has argued? So, Professor Alvare? I'm muting. So, um, I don't think you're going to see abortion win on an originalist argument, either in a due process or an equal protection context. I think it will continue to be the subject of the harshest political battles, um, despite all the talk about how stare decisis should be respected. I think the very moment that the opportunity is presented to install justices who believe that a right of abortion should be uh, declared a constitutional right, that, that it will be done. And then they will flip the Dobbs opinion. <laughs> it hasn't taken it out of the political process uh, at all. Um, there's no originalist argument. Originalism comes in many flavors, but there's no originalist argument that will, will win it here. You're really going to have to sort of force it the way that Dobbs reports Roe and Casey did. Um, the equal protection argument that was uh, a thought of um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, the court dismissed it in Dobbs saying, you know, we've always said that, um, you know, the statement about abortion is, is when a state is speaking about it, they are speaking about the fact that this is human life and states are allowed to protect life no matter how small. This is not a statement about, about women. It's a statement that we choose um, to value all life. And um, so I just, I, I see it only as a political matter. Again, um, those supporting legal abortion will run you know, candidates and races, presidential appointments, senators to get enough people to, to flip Dobbs and forget everything that they said about stare decisis the minute they can. I think that's more likely. Thank you. And Professor Gutierrez Roman. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how long it would take to codify Roe if that were even to, or you know, codify abortion rights, even if that were. Uh, an option. I think for one, it would require a fundamental change in how we discuss and talk about abortion. I think even people who are, you know, pro-choice, um, it, it's a topic people tend to tiptoe around um, because it is often controversial. And so I don't think that we will, and I think it will take a while before we uh, see people who are willing to advocate, or at least a significant number of people who are willing to advocate for it in a way that is enough to, um, you know, put it into to law to protect it. Um, and so I, I think, you know, it is often, you know, used or manipulated as a way to kind of get people to vote for them, but then there hasn't been a lot of action on, you know, protecting or preserving abortion rights, even when you know, Democrats did have the presidency and both houses of Congress. So I'm not sure what it would take. I mean, I know, I, I believe that, you know, given the current, um, you know, with the Dobbs decision, I think some states will move to protect it, some states will move to restrict it, and we're going to see a patchwork of legislation. Um, but what would it take for some kind of national protections? I'm not sure that that is going to happen in the immediate future. Thank you, and Professor Regan. Hi. Well, classically, historians don't like to predict. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Uh, what we uh, have at our getting is a patchwork of laws across the country, which was precisely the situation before the Roe versus Wade decision. And of course, this has been developing 
um, since Casey with the many restrictions that have been allowed. Um, but that, that too was part of federal decisions um, in the courts that, you know, it's unequal depending on where you live. And that is already proving to be quite problematic in terms of state laws, in terms of people's rights, in terms of mobility, in terms of access to medical care, and the already damaged medical care because of doctors uh, and pharmaceutical pharmacies, uh, the local drug stores fears that they will be prosecuted. So what we have is, and it's going to be, you know, a really horrible situation for some people. For some people, of course, we know you know, and I, I really appreciate the Republican governors with the anti-abortion laws saying, well, they can go to another state. Like, this is very convenient to suddenly be willing to have, well, you know, go there. We have a, we have a safety valve. Well, you know, the Roe decision kind of did that. It, it, it created a situation where there was more kind of equality in terms of what the law was and access instead of um, if you have money, if you have the knowledge, if you have connections, you will be able to find a safe abortion. And this recreates uh, the need for, you know, about half the country to find a way to do it illegally, do it themselves, or travel thousands of miles, probably over days, uh, to go to another state or potentially another country um, to get a safe abortion. And plenty of people will be able to do that, but plenty of people will never know where the abortion fund is that will help them, will never know who's safe, will never know that actually it's safe in the state next to them. And those are going to be, you know, teenagers, uh, you know, uh, people without access to this kind of information, people without money, the people with children, who are the majority of people who receive abortions today are low income mothers who are black and brown and that that's the effects of this, I guess i'm not answering as to what I think will happen, I mean I think there's going to be suffering and we're also seeing uh, that people are seeing it and objecting and you know what was incredibly important before was that the medical profession came to believe across the board, the majority uh, that abortion, the abortion law should be repealed. And they, that played an important role in that decision, as well as, of course, all the activism on the streets. Um, and so we're already seeing that. How it's going to end up, we don't know how long it'll take. Hopefully not 100 years is what I say, uh, but it could be decades. Thank you. And Professor Regan, the remarks you just made uh, dovetail nicely with another anonymous question submitted to me by a student. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read it. It's directed at Professor Avare. It reads as follows. What is your response to the argument that women who come from high class families with the means will be able to have abortions, whereas minority and poor women will continue to suffer socioeconomically without the option? I want to recommend the book to this person by two female sociologists that's really considered one of the leading pieces in its field. It's absolutely magnificent. It's by Catherine Eden and Maria Kafalis called Promises I Can Keep, Why Poor Women Put Motherhood Before Marriage. And it's two sociologists who lived with women of every background in Philadelphia and Camden for years. And what they report and what you still see in the Centers for Disease Control Statistics is that women of color actually abort a lower percentage of their pregnancies. They, they actually are more welcoming to life in part. And women with more money, um, they, they abort lots of them in part because they, they believe that the opportunity costs of having a child are really, really high and that they would be giving away their sort of ticket to middle-class life. Uh, for poor women, I think, to me, frankly, it's a bit of a civil rights cause to ensure that they have greater access to stable fathers in their lives. And we already know that the excess incarceration of black and brown men, the racism in the United States, poverty, et cetera, is depriving those communities of a marriage culture 
that would allow women to accept children into an environment which would be more welcoming. It's a more ambitious, it's a more expensive, it's a more generous. I think it's a far better human rights strategy than just trying to make more abortions available to women who, according to opinion, want fewer uh, abortions in their lives, want children more, and probably would prefer the kind of help that uh, they need versus just offering them more abortion. At this point, I'd invite Professor Gutierrez Romain to respond. And I would also mention Professor Gutierrez Romain, uh, you, you uh, placed in the chat, which might not be visible to attendees, um, that uh, in, in response to a previous question, you had recommended Jennifer Holland's book, uh, Tiny You, um, uh, an overview of the pro-life movement, particularly in the American West. Um, so I just wanted to add that for the benefit of the recording. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Well, uh Professor Regan wanted, I think you wanted to say something to respond. You're you're welcome to go ahead of me. Okay, if I can now remember what I was thinking. Um, oh. <laughs> no, I, I actually wanted to uh, speak to, I mean, I think the study that uh, Helen referred to is actually, you know, great book and really important. Um, but speak to the assumption, assumption that being for legal, safe legal abortion means that that's the only thing that uh, feminist scholars uh, uh, actually care about or are concerned about. Um, the reproductive rights movement, now the reproductive justice movement, named and led by African-American feminists, brown feminists, is absolutely emphasizes the necessity of making it possible for people to make their own decisions about when they will have children, whether they have children, and that requires being able to, to know that you will not be kicked out of school, you will not lose your job, that there is that you will have housing, that you have a basic income, and your children will be able, well, you don't have to worry about uh, lack of food and hunger in this country. So all of these basics, and we don't have that. That is not a result of Roe versus Wade or feminist thought. <laughs> this is a much larger problem. And we might agree, we, I think, seemingly agree on some of these things. However, again, to be frank, the party that placed these justices most recently onto the Supreme Court is the Republican Party. And it does not support those kind of social um, services or guarantees in our country. The situation would be different for a lot of people. And, and, you know, we don't know what the situation, you know, if they had everything they needed, some people will say, oh, I can, I can have this child. And some will conclude it's still not the right time. Uh, so it does get back to fundamentally, do people have any um, moral right, human rights, citizens right to make their own decisions about their moral consciousness, about their bodies and about reality that they are living in? Or should the law and a social movement be forcing people to make the decision that they prefer and that they believe to be correct? Professor Gutierrez Roman, uh, did you want to add anything or shall we move on? Uh, no, I think um, you know the discussion of the reproductive justice movement I think is also important because it does address some of these other things that it suggests that those who do want to have children will be provided for, will have the resources that they need. And that is just as important as maintaining the right to a legal abortion. So it is not, you know, an anti-mothering. It is not uh, an anti, you know, having children out of wedlock or anything movement. It is about making sure that people have the ability to make the choices that they think are best for them and then providing options, whether that choice is to have a child or terminate a pregnancy. I just put up my hand in a quick response that it just, it, it just, it's just um, a point that just keeps coming back to me that if, as Professor Gutierrez Romain said, it's really about having the choice, then one of the things you would expect from the leading abortion providers, Planned Parenthood being leading among them, is some robust assistance in that area. And it would be welcome around now 
and it would be good to see it begin. And I maybe we could find something that would be, you know, we could agree on. They they have enormous bequests from pro-choice sponsors, and this could be a place to expend some of it. Thank you. That's all. Okay, uh, with that, I want to thank our audience for their excellent questions, and I want to thank our speakers for their thoughtful responses. That's all the time we have for Q&A, so now I'll turn it back to Crystal. Thank you, Ed. Um, now I'll invite our speakers to go down the line in their original speaking order and just offer closing remarks about one to two minutes each. I'd invite our speakers to use this time to address the single most significant point that you all believe our discussion has raised, and we'll begin with Professor Alvare. I think probably all the speakers here can agree that women's ability to be pregnant and the disproportionate care that women as distinguished from men provide for children has led to pressure on women, uh, pressure against their happily being able to accept childbearing. And I think that we might find common ground in removing that pressure from women, but my view would also be a consistent ethic of life, which would say that we protect the other who is different from us, who has different needs, who is more vulnerable, but that that should include every human being, all of us <clears throat> begin uh, as an unborn child, and that those should be uh, included in the community of care. There's probably a lot we could agree about on women, even if we cannot agree to extend recognition to this human life. Uh, the law is not going to go the whole hog that way. It's going to protect some life before birth, not all. States have patchworks of laws on hundreds of things, and they will have it on this as well uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Professor Alvarez. Next, we'll hear from Professor Gutierrez Romain. Uh, I think it's important to remember that um, laws against abortion, abortion restriction will not stop abortions from taking place. And so if we're even just looking at this from a risk perspective or a risk benefit perspective, uh, it still does protect more women to have legal abortions accessible. Um, and that there will always be options and exceptions for women who have means. And so thinking about this again, from an equity perspective, we it is imperative that we keep legal access to abortion. Thank you, Professor Gutierrez Romain. We'll hear from Professor Regan next. I thought I would underline the importance of safe abortions um, in terms of public health in terms of women's health, um, public health and well-being. Uh, it is the case that when abortion became legal, maternal mortality fell 30, 40, 50%, depending on where you look, to the extent we have data. Um, it doesn't mean that maternal mortality is going to go up by that percentage in the future because it's being criminalized now, because the situations are different. Uh, we have medication abortion, but this is true around the world. Maternal mortality and morbi morbidity are far, far worse where people are not able to easily access, find uh, safe abortions. And criminalizing abortion means it will be hard to find. The laws will be uh, used against uh, the people who are pregnant, they don't have to even be seeking an abortion, uh, which we really haven't even gotten into. These laws have horrible health effects and people will find themselves under investigation. These kinds of laws undermine the trust of women and their doctors because they were treated as liars. And that was, they kind of had to because if they, if they believe them when they said they were miscarrying, they might be prosecuted for doing an abortion. And that is what's happening. So this is, um, this is extremely cruel. Okay, thank you, Professor Reagan. Um, okay, so before I draw our event to a close, I'd like to ask our audience to do two things. 
Firstly, please fill out the survey that you will receive via email after the event. Your feedback is important to us. And if you provide your email address, we'll let you know about upcoming events in the series. Secondly, please join me in giving a warm round of virtual applause to our speakers for sharing their ideas and being with us here today. Um, a, video of this, a video recording of this event will be posted on the NEIU Library's YouTube channel. So thank you all for being with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you all.